Amen. If you got your Bibles, we'll be in 2 Peter chapter 3 today. As we wrap up our series on warnings, and I don't think that we could find any more fitting scripture than 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 1 through 9 for where we stand today. As you know, we've been working through this series and we've been looking at, the, at warnings and, 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 the, and the, we've been focused on how the tornado warnings work, and specifically April 11th, April 27th, 2011, and the tornado outbreak that took so many lives, 252 lives in Alabama. And I don't want to continuously beat you down with the details of this, but I want you to understand the seriousness of the warnings. Warnings were given that day. People didn't respond. People perished. People saw the tornadoes coming, and they still stood there in the face of it and lost their lives. I don't think of anything that I, there, there's no better example than I can give you of the day of the Lord. The return of the Lord is coming. And people know it. People hear it. We scream it. We shout it. Yet we are standing in the face of it and people are not responding. It's a very big deal. That's why when I've looked at this and I just, I can't find any better parallels. And today when we look at it today, the very message that I want everyone to get is that they didn't hasten the warning. They didn't hasten the warning, and we are standing in the same circumstances in our Christian walk. And so what do I mean by that? People had heard so many tornado warnings. They'd heard so many over the years, and time after time after time, it never proved true. They'd issue a tornado warning, and nothing would happen. The wind would blow, the storm would come, and it would pass, and nothing happened. And so when it really got real that day, people just assumed it was another false alarm. The old saying, you cry wolf so many times and you just don't respond. That's where the public was. If y'all bring that slide up with the, with the tornado warning. We've seen these signs. We've seen these pictures. They float on the internet all the time. And that is legitimate. That is a real polygon. That is a real tornado warning. That's Calhoun County. That's a storm bearing down on Piedmont. That's probably one of them that come through here. I'm not even sure which day that one was. That's the real deal. We're standing in the face of the return of the Lord, guys. We can preach it. We can sing it. We can say it. We can talk about rising. But until we take that serious, until we take it serious, until we take it serious, we're bearing down the eye of the storm and people are perishing. You need to make that personal. Are, you, are those around you perishing? It's time that we get serious about it. This is not a false alarm. It is real. Are we going to hasten the warning? Are you going to hasten it today? That's enough. This has ascended into Jesus has hastened to it. We see you hasten to it. If you haven't done in this moment, don't continue to sit and watch. Let the Lord's way in your life. If you've got your Bible, 2 Peter chapter 3, stand with me. Verses 1 through 9, if you don't have it, it'll be on the screen above us, behind me. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by, by way of a reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking around to their own lust and saying, where is, for since the fall things continue from the beginning of creation, for this they will, that by the word of God, the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the, wor the world that, that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved until the day of judgment. Addition, but, beloved, do not the Lord that is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I love you. God, thank you so much for your word. God, thank you so much for your promises and for loving us. Thanks, Lord, through your word, through your promises, that we truly, truly experience you every single heart in here. Lord, if there's one that has not truly surrendered to you, God, make them see the dire need of me. People in here that are not, there's people in here that sins infiltrated their life. God, they've turned their back to you. Wherever they stand, God, meet them right where they, let them understand the seriousness of the times. 
And Lord, open heart and open where it is that you desire of them. Father, I pray that every soul in here is touched by your presence. We thank you and we praise you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we must be guarded. We must be guarded or we're going to fail onto the warning. It's easy to neglect things. It's easy to just kind of forget where we're from sometimes. But we have to happen. We've heard so many warnings. I remember going to a little, a little old, um, was growing up, teeny tiny, tiny ones. And I remember the hell, fire, brimstone. The, the, Jesus is returning. He's going to come back before the end of my days and just hearing it time and time and time again. We become words. As we work through the strength that you should be able to stand it a whole lot better. Just because Jesus said that he would be returned, initially left earth and 2,000 years have passed. He's coming. He's coming back for his people. He's people. He's come judged, prepared. And, we, and when we do, and let this warning be taken to heart. We must be guarded because here's the three things I want to talk about today. We must be guarded and we must hasten the warning because first and foremost, there are clueless, there are pragmatists, and they're all in the church place. Clueless pragmatist, what do I mean by that? A pragmatist is someone that has to see to believe. It has to be tangible. They have to be able to put their hands on it. If they can, it's not good enough. Why do you think the Pharisees said time after time after time to Jesus, show us a sign, show us a sign, show us a sign, because they were pragmatists. They wanted tangible proof. They wanted tangible proof that he was exactly who he said he was. They didn't want to look at Scripture, which they knew better than anybody else, and see that he was the true Messiah. Well, proof. They wanted him to perform miracles and do all the things that they wanted. They wanted him to be who they desired, not who... Do you think we get in that same predicament today, too? We want Jesus to be who we want him to be. We don't want him to be the Jesus of the Scriptures. Let me tell you something. We want the Jesus of the Scriptures. You just don't really realize it until you get him, until you have him, until you really experience him. We need the Jesus of the Scriptures. We don't need to be the pragmatist. But there's a very big problem with this. There's a very big problem with being a pragmatist. Not only do you miss Jesus, but in the real world, when real things happen, you miss out on them. It's a big deal when it comes to severe weather. Pragmatism cost many people their lives in 2011. It cost many people their lives. And I'm going to explain why. I have some statistics here. And man, they relate directly to our Christian walk. Did you know that prior to the tornado outbreak of September, excuse me, April 27, 2011, the inaccuracy rating for tornado warnings, only 80, excuse me, 83% of tornado warnings did not produce a tornado. 83%. That means that only out of 117 tornado worn storms had a tornado in them. Do you think people were becoming cold to that? Tornado warning, tornado warning, and nothing happens. Absolutely. We become cold to it. But you're telling me something's going to happen and it really don't happen. I don't want to hear that anymore. And so let's be really tangible with that. That means that 83 storms did, but 17 still did. We need to remember that. But here's the thing. 30% of the tornadoes that actually hit the ground never even had a warning. The, torna the, the, the stats are just so skewed. And then here's the thing. Here's the thing. While it has gotten better, we're still not in a perfect place. Now we're at an inaccuracy rating of 58% since 2011. So 58 times out of 100 when a tornado warning comes, a tornado does not touch the ground. But 42 times it does. Is that enough to make you respond is that enough to make you respond, or do you, do you just sit back and watch? Do you wait and see what the weather's going to do? I'm going to tell you something. People have been saying for 2,000 years, Jesus is returning tomorrow, today, any moment. He's just as likely right now as he is at any other time. It could happen. Everything is in place. Everything is falling into place. But what are you doing with it? Are we like these pragmatists that are waiting on the tornado, waiting on the statistics to get better? Are we going to wait till it's a 100% accuracy rating before we do something about it? Or are we going to trust that when they say one's coming, we respond? Are we going to trust that when the Scripture says that everything's falling into place and Jesus is returning, are we going to trust that it's real? We have pragmatism throughout our churches. What are we going to do? So how does this, how does this truly apply to Scripture? Let's look back into 2 Peter 3. One and two, it says, Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, and both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Peter's reminding us that we better be mindful of the words that have been spoken before us. We need to be mindful of them. So what's he mean by that? He's talking about the things that were before 
It's not just any word. It's the holy prophets and of the commandments of the apostles of the Lord Savior. So Peter's teaching we've got to be mindful of the prophets. That means we need to be mindful of the Old Testament. We've got to be mindful of the things that were said before, before Jesus. We need to know those things. You know, a lot of times we just want to read the New Testament. We want to read the Jesus stories. But there's a lot of Jesus stories in the Old Testament too. We need to know those. We need to understand Scripture from front to back. We don't just need to take it and we're going to lose context. We need to know it all. But he also said that we need to be mindful of the things spoken by the apostles. Not just the prophets. We need to be mindful of the things spoken by the apostles. That means we need to be mindful of the New Testament. We have to take the entire Bible and we don't need to pick and choose. We're only going to do this. We're only going to do that. We need to have the whole thing. Sometimes we like to pick and choose, but we have to take it all in. Why? Because all of it was either spoken by God or inspired by His Spirit. If it was important enough for him to include it in one end, it was important enough in the other, and we need to take it all in. But when we look around, I want you to ask yourself, how much time do you spend studying your entire Bible? How much time do you spend studying what somebody else says about the Bible? I'm not saying that we don't use resources to help us, but you need to know Scripture front and back. You need to know it all. Otherwise, we, bec we start letting our guard down. Where do you get your information from for how you respond to God's touch? Are you just waiting on the Spirit to move you in a certain way? Or do you know what His Word says so that you can compare your feelings and know if it's a feeling or if it's the Spirit guiding you? You've got to know God's Word. We need to be mindful of it. If you don't believe me, turn on half of the so-called Christian channels these days. If you don't believe that you need to know Scripture and you need to understand it from forward to backward, turn on half of these so-called Christian channels. I do it. I used to do it for a laugh. But it burns me up inside when I turn it on. Hey, give me money and we'll pray for you and send you some holy water. Hey, send me money and we'll do this. Send me money and you're going to be helping the kingdom. Send me money, send me money, send me money. If somebody starts off by saying, send me money, cut it off. Cut it off. Don't listen to that. They're trying to sell you prosperity that is not biblical. You know the best way to guard against that, though, is know God's word. God's not begging for your money in anything. Is he telling you to be obedient through tithes and offering? Absolutely. He's blessed you. You need to give back. But he is not demanding not one thing from you. Matter of fact, in Malachi, it says that if you will, if you, if, when you open up the storehouses, when you give, he'll open up a window to heaven for you. He wants to bless you through that, but he is not telling you prosperity by sending money to the church. That will never be the case. But you've got to know God's Word. You've got to understand these things. And they go much deeper than that. They, go, they play mind games and tricks, and they're really intelligent. They're so charismatic. People are so charismatic. It's not just on TV. It's in church. It's everywhere you go. People are so charismatic. They can sell you anything. My wife's dad, is this car, he's the best car, used car salesman in the world. He'll sell you a lemon and think you've got a Cadillac, the best brand new Cadillac in the world. He can do it. There are people who are charismatic. They can do those things. That's why you have to know what you're dealing with. And you can only do it by having the full scriptures in your heart. And the clueless protagonist only lives, listen, they're only living in the tangible, like I mentioned. They're truly clueless. And I'm going to tell you, I used to be one of those people. I thought I knew everything. Before I got saved, I thought I knew everything. If you asked me if I was saved, I would argue, to, argue with you to the death that I had salvation. Why? Because I thought I knew what salvation was. I'd heard about it all my life. I'd prayed. I said, Jesus, save me. And I thought I had it all figured out. But as I, what happened, I opened up God's Word one day. And I started reading it. And there's a lot of other things that God put in place to help me see it. But through His Word, He tr truly showed me what real salvation was. And through that, I knew I didn't have it. He had to change me through His Word. That's how God works through us. If you don't want to be a pragmatist, pragmatist, be guarded and know his word. Know it. I looked for proof of a real relationship with Jesus in all the wrong places. And it was right in front of me the entire time. I just never looked there. I had no idea. I thought I had an idea of what a relationship with Jesus looked like, and then I opened my Bible. Then, here's the thing, though. It didn't just end with salvation. I thought I knew what it meant to follow Jesus after I had a relationship with him. Then I opened up his word, and I found a whole new way. God called me into ministry. I was like, man, I've got this figured out now. You know what? I opened up his word. I didn't know anything. And he's still working on me. Every time I think I have something figured out, he shows me something new. But it's only going to come if we're mindful of his word. We've got to be guarded of it. Don't become 
Don't become like these folks. And I'm not, listen, you know, I always say, don't be like the, 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 the Pharisees who made, you know, they, they made fun of people for not being like them. They put them down. But we don't need to say we don't need to be like the Pharisees. We just need to be like Jesus. Stop not being like people and just be like Jesus. Jesus was in, he was constantly talking to God, constantly sharing who God was, constantly sharing the, all of these things. He was opening up the scrolls. That is what we are to be doing too. I could get off in a whole other place here. Let's, let's get back, folks. But here's the thing. We need to stop living only in the tangible. If you only live in the tangible, you're going to miss out on so much. We were created to live in the supernatural. That's a word you don't hear in church very often. The supernatural. But if you don't believe in the supernatural, you might as well not believe in a virgin birth. You might as well not believe in a resurrected Savior. You might as well not believe in a place called heaven because it's all supernatural. It can't be done by man. And so if we continue to live in the tangible, we're never going to have those things. We were created for the supernatural. Don't look down on that word, but you're not going to do it through tangibility. We have to do it through trusting in the Lord. Do you have that? Have you hastened the warning? Have you moved past being the pragmatist that I have experienced for so much of my life? If you have, we must hasten the warning and, and be and guard against the clueless protagonist, but we also must be given to the continuous preparation. The continuous preparation. I talked last week about many of the major storms that have come through this area. You know, at one time we said they'll never come here, and then they did come here. We, we, we've had a lot of discussion about that. But not only did we always say those storms would never hit us, what happens after they come? How quickly do we forget about the destruction that they caused? How, how quickly does it just, do we forget it? But, you know, I think about it all the time. Most of the people in this room, most, I'm excluding this little group right here, we lived through September 11th. How fresh is that on your mind in this very moment? Go back, though, to 2001, and how fresh was it on your mind every single day right after it happened? It was constant. We were constantly thinking about it. We were constantly talking about it. Even the year past it, we were constantly talking about it. It was fresh. We were going to war. We were fighting through it all. But as time has progressed, we've forgotten more and more and more about it to the place where we're almost cold to it now. It's like it didn't even happen. We do the same thing with storms. They come through, and as time passes, we forget we forget what happened. We let those times pass. It's not such a big deal anymore. And so when the next one comes, we're, we're our guard has come down. We're not as prepared. The impacts are just not the same. They're just not the same anymore. The value is not the same. Even, and even in this, how many people even knew the date April 27, 2011? 252 Alabamians, 252 people in our state lost their life that day. But how many of us even remember that specific day? You know, I mean, what year was it them tornadoes come through and all them people died? That's where we get to. We just forget. But we have the same problem in our churches. We have the same problem in our churches. We forget all the things that God has done. Whether it was when you got saved and you, man, there's no telling what you got saved from. I don't know. I know the things that God saved me from. It's a miracle. It's an absolute miracle that he saved me. But what happens after salvation? Time passes. Time passes. Time passes. And we get farther and farther away from that day that he touched us, and we forget how impactful that moment was. We forget the things that his blood has covered. We forget about the things that we're still even doing in the moment that he's forgiving us for. We forget about all of that. It becomes not so important anymore. We become cold and numb and dull to things. You know, I think about it. Maybe this is why Crystal and I had so many children, because that moment was so special and I forgot, and we needed to do it again and again and again. I don't know. Maybe that's what it was. But the thing is with our Christian walk, we've been born again. We've been made new. We need to constantly go back to that place and remember it. We need to understand. And let me say, you may be sitting there right now and saying, that will never happen to me. I'll never go back into sin. I'll never forget what's happened. Don't you dare say that. Don't say it will never be you. The moment you say it, it's you. You're going to forget. You're going to let things come up. We are still human and we're still broken. Things are going to get in the way. Don't ever say it won't be you. But it's all in how we respond that makes the difference. It's all in how we respond that makes the difference. So how does this even, listen, we let our guard down, we get swept away and scoffers, yes, verses 5 and 6, for this 
They willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded by water. Listen, so what, what Peter's saying here is there was a time when God said, I'm going to flood the earth. We talked about this last week with Noah. There's going to be a time. He said, I'm going to flood the earth. And you know what God did? He flooded the earth. He flooded the earth. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. But what happened after that? Noah and his family survived, and then time started passing. Time started passing. And what did the world do? It took them no time till they were in, in Babel, and he's having to scatter them and, 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 and do all the things he did there because they started forgetting what had happened. We do the same thing when I was talking about our salvation. He comes in, he saves us, and we start forgetting what he's done. Or we get ourselves in a pinch, and we go, God, save me, forgive me, bring me out of this. And he comes, and he miraculously pulls you out of whatever it is you've gotten into. And then three weeks later, you're right back in it because you completely forgot what he had done for you. Do you not call that willfully forgetting if you just constantly forget time and time and time again? Absolutely. But inside, the, inside this scripture, it's not just the ones that are that are saved, I mean, there, God, there are people all in here that have willfully forgotten what God has done and what he wants to do. God wants us to remember his works. God wants us to go back to when he saved us. He wants us to remember those moments. He wants to remember when he uses us. He doesn't want us to forget him because he wants to continue to do those things through our lives. And in verse 7 it says, But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And so here's what happens. We forget that God's already cast judgment on earth one time. And now he's promising he's going to do it again. You better believe that that promise is true. The first time by water, the second time by fire. It is coming. Judgment is coming. It is a promise of God. It is going to happen and it is preserved by the same word. What does that mean? It is a promise from God. It is true. It is real. It is preserved. You can guarantee it. You can bet your paycheck on it, as we say so often. You can guarantee that this judgment is coming. And listen, it wasn't just that judgment's coming. There was salvation available. The people in Noah's time chose not to respond. They didn't hasten the warning. They walked right by that boat. They walked right by that work. They continuously, they, they just turned their back to it all. They didn't hasten the warning. Salvation was available to them before the flood. Salvation is available to you before the fire. Are you heeding that warning? Are you hastening to it? We have to make those choices. That same judgment is coming. In Psalm 51 through 6, it says, The mighty one, God the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very temptuous all around him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together to me. Those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. If you missed it, it said, Our God shall come and not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him. We will be judged by fire. It's throughout Scripture. It's going to happen. Peter has clearly warned us, and the prophets of old have told us, and God has said that he would judge the world by water, and he did. Now, Peter is again telling us that the world's going to be judged by fire, and the prophets of old have told us the same thing. It's going to happen. It's been preserved by his word. So we must continuously be prepared for what is to come. If we don't, we've let our guard down, and we've opened ourselves up, to whatever it is that we're given to. This world will overtake us. Satan will win in your life when you let your guard down. It's going to happen. I don't care who you are, how holy you are, he will find a way when you bring your guard down. It's going to happen. I don't know how many men have stood in a pulpit and preached with power. They've seen salvations. They've seen lives change forever. They've seen people, saints grow to mighty, mighty, they've seen people grow from my, little warriors all the way into mighty saints under their preaching. And then they have fallen right out of the pulpit when they said it would never happen to them because they let their guard down. Don't think it can happen to one of them and not happen to you. Keep your guard up. Are you planning to be prepared? 
If that polygon is aimed at you right now, which it is, Satan's temptuous darts are pointed right at you. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? We have to answer that question. Are you planning or are you prepared? But lastly, to hasten the warning, we must receive the certain promise. We must receive the certain promise. I can give you a warning. I can give you a promise. I can give you all things. But nothing that I give you is certain except for the Word of God and His promises. He gave us a rainbow to remember them by. Do you remember them? We're going to experience bad weather. It's going to happen. Bad weather is going to come. And so are God's promises. They're even more certain than that bad weather. Look in verse 8. It says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. I remember hearing that when I was younger, going, What in the world? A thousand years, a thousand days, a day. What? That's, listen, we ain't God. Stop trying to figure God out. You're never going to. He is so much higher, so much greater, so much bigger, so much more than you could ever comprehend in our little brains. The point of it is well, that's exactly what Peter's telling us here. God, a thousand years, is nothing. It's the blink of an eye to him. But each day is special to him. He's not saying that a day's not special. But the point is this, just because Jesus didn't return yesterday, today, or tomorrow doesn't mean he's not coming the next day. We're on God's time, not ours. Stop trying to make it our time. It is God's time. And you're not guaranteed not one more second, not one more second of it. This is where it gets really serious. It's really easy, especially when we're young. We sit there and we think, oh, I've got all of this in front of me. I still remember I was planning for retirement when I was 19 years old. 18 years old, I was wasting my life away. 19 years old, I was planning for retirement. I've been planning for it since then. And I know that many people in this room have done the same. I know that many didn't even think about retirement until they were 45 or 50. And then, they went, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? But the point is this. We're not guaranteed another second. I was planning for retirement not knowing that I would ever even see marriage. I was planning for retirement not even knowing that I was going to have children. I was planning for retirement not knowing that I was lost. I was planning for retirement having no idea the things that God wanted to do in my life. It's really easy for us to not think about things that way. It's really easy to think we've got all the time in the world to figure all these things out. We're not guaranteed another second. Because just as a thousand years are a day to him, so is a day. It could be here at any moment. We don't know when he's coming. We just know that he's coming. And here's the thing. In verse 9 it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. He's not slack. That means that he's going to fulfill his promises. Every one of them. All of this scripture continuously points back to God keeps his promises. I think if Peter wanted us to understand one thing more than anything else, God's serious. God keeps his promises. If he speaks it, it's going to come. We need to grasp that. You can literally hang your hat on it. But it says that some count slackness. In other words, we think differently. Again, we think differently than God. We think, how many times have you told somebody you were going to do something and didn't do it? With all your heart, you meant that you were going to? God, don't do that. God says it. God keeps it. God does it. And the rest of verse 9 says, But the Lord is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I love, love, love this. I love this because you hear of Calvinism, you hear of the Reformation, you hear of all these different things where they say not everybody can be saved. There's exclusions. Only certain people are going to be saved. You cannot read this scripture and not say that God's not for everyone. He wants everyone to come to salvation. He is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any, any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord is long-suffering because he wants us all to do that. He wants us all to come to repentance. The good news in that is if you've not come to repentance before right now, he's long-suffering. He has waited and waited and waited for you. He's waited for this very moment for you to come to salvation. Have you done that, though? Are you going to respond? You're staring down the eye of the storm. Are you going to respond? Are you going to continue to push it off? If you're walking in, if you know that you have salvation, and you know that you're walking in disobedience right now, He's given you this opportunity. He's long-suffering to repentance. He's long-suffering. He is just waiting for you. He's waiting for you. He wants you. 
But there comes a point where that long suffering comes to an end. It stops. Our time is limited. We have to do something with it. And listen, so I searched. I told you, I brought up Calvinism and, and this. I searched for John Calvin. I searched for his words on this. I wanted to see how he dealt with this scripture. Because again, he's in limited atonement. Only certain people can be saved. Not everybody has the opportunity to salvation. So I wanted to see how he dealt with the scripture. This is what he said. So wonderful is his love, talking about God, so wonderful is his, is his love towards mankind that he would have them all to be saved. Huh. That he would have them all to be saved. And is of his own self prepared, and is of his own self prepared to bestow salvation to the lost. So even somebody that wants to talk about limited atonement can't answer for this. All means all. And that is so stinking important to us. Because I can't tell you how many times I've had a conversation with somebody that says, I know that God loves me. I know that he wanted to save me. But I've done this, this, or this. And he's not going to save me because of what I've done. He can't save me. I'm too far gone. If you only knew half the things that I've done... God already knows, and he still loves you, and he still wants to save you. Even if you've rejected him, even if you've rejected him, you've felt that tug on your heart, and you know that he's called your name, he can call it again right now if you'll just open your ears and listen. Have you, he wants to save everyone, even a Calvinist, even the Calvin that is the Calvinist that Calvinism come from can't answer for that. Jesus wants to save us all. God wants you to be saved, and he didn't put anything to qualify now, out there. He just wants to save you. He wants you to come to repentance in him and be covered by the blood of Jesus. God's heart is that everyone would not perish, not one. He doesn't desire that. We make that choice, not him. He desires that no one perish, but that all would come to repentance. So what are you doing with what the Lord has given you? If you're not saved, he's offering salvation to you. If you're saved, he's offering repentance to you to walk back in his ways. If you're where you belong, then you need to stay focused and guarded. What are you doing with what he's given you? He has given you time, that is for certain, because he's been long-suffering. You can still be saved right now. Don't leave here without it. Time is running out. What will you do? He's put people in your life to lead you out of something. Think back. God's put people in your life time after time after time to bring you to him. What are you doing with that? Are you honoring it? Are you caught up in something right now that you need to be pulled out of? We talk so often about times of repentance only being for salvation. Listen, the saved get caught in sin too. And it's time that we get out of it. Stop, st get out of that dark hole and walk in the light. He wants to work in you. He wants to use you. But he's given you gifts for his glory. What are you doing with them? Are you hiding them away because you're afraid of your sin getting called out? Just repent. Just repent. Just repent. God is long-suffering for us all. 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 It means all. And it's time that we respond. We have seen the destruction of what the storms have done in this area. I think that we would take it serious if a tornado warning went out right now. I think we would. But we have seen the destruction of God's judgment on man. And there's another one to come. It's time that we respond and quit taking it lightly. It is the Christmas season. We have passed Thanksgiving. It's officially the Christmas season. We're going to be celebrating the coming of Jesus for the next month. As a child, into this earth, in a flesh. How about this? Let's be so prepared for his return that we celebrate that. Because we're ready we're prepared, and we're excitedly looking up to heaven for the trumpet's call and for our time in glory with the king. Are you ready for that today? If not, get right right now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I love you. God, thank you so much for your word. God, thank you for the warnings. Thank you for everything that you've shown us. And God, thank you for touching us. Lord, I pray that as we go to this time of invitation, Lord, if somebody in here has never truly surrendered their life to you, God, let them see. Let them see how much you love them. Let them see how much you love them. That is the one thing that nobody can take away from us, that you love us no matter what we've done. God, show them. Let them feel it. Let them experience And let them understand it through the cross. Because if it wasn't for the cross, we would be hopeless. 
But God, you prepared a way through the blood of Jesus, through the life of Jesus, through the perfection of Jesus for us all. Lord, let us experience true lordship in this moment. If we've never experienced, let it be into salvation. If we have, let us walk in repentance and be usable for you. God, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you so much for your touch. Come in power in this moment. And let your glory reign. Lord, we love you, and we thank you, and we praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we move into this time of invitation, just be sensitive to the Spirit. It's so easy to sit there and resist and resist and resist and resist. Every time you resist, it becomes easier. At some point, your heart's going to turn hard and you're not going to respond ever again. Don't let that be today. Don't let your heart turn hard. Hard. Don't let your heart turn hard. Be movable. Be malleable. Let the Lord have his way in your life. It will be the greatest decision you've ever made. Stand with me. If you need salvation, please come grab me by the hand. I'd love nothing more than, lead you, than to lead you to Jesus right here, right now. If you need to pray, if you need repentance, if you need to just have some time with the Lord, the altar is wide open. If you're looking for a church home, if this is where God's leading you, we would love nothing more than you to join us today. Just respond and just come.